we are ready for the last talk of today, and our next speaker has experience from companies like Ubisoft and us too. Uh, he is the technical artist turned indie to create a very interesting game, Bad North. Please welcome Oskar Stolberg. Hello, does this work? Yeah. Uh, yeah, as you can see, I'm Oscar Stolberg. Um, I'll just start by introducing myself. I uh, used to work for Ubisoft Massive, where I, among as a technical artist, where I uh, did a bunch of shader work and, among other things, made the cool like holographic 3D map in the division. Uh, I'm like one of my big interests is uh, procedural generation, and this talk is going to be a lot about procedural gen. Oh, that's very interesting. That is very, there we go. Okay, let's keep tabs on that. Uh, yeah, this talk is gonna be a lot about procedural generation because uh, Bad North is all about procedural generation. Basically all aspects of the game are procedurally generated in some kind of way. Uh, here are two like earlier examples of procedural, procedurally generated demos I've done. One of them you get to build a little red brick house and one of them you get to terraform a sort of medieval era planet both of these you can find uh, online and play in your browser. If you just Google my name and brick block for that one and just planet for that one, you'll find them. Or just Google my name, you'll find them. Um, and that sort of, so those I did on my spare time. So that got me started around like thinking about procedural generation and more specifically thinking about kind of content driven uh, tile based procedural generation in 3D worlds. Uh, which, sent the, uh, which later would turn into stuff that would become Bad North. So that's enough about me. Uh, so how, what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to uh, soon going to open up Unity and take a poke around and look at like what Bad North looks like in the scene view in Unity and like what happens when we tweak a bunch of values and stuff like that. Uh, but we'll take with us some like core design principles or sort of aesthetic principles that. I, th I think permeates the design of, of Bad North. And these are mostly like, these aren't things I came up with before, well, some of them are, but most of them aren't things I came up with before I started working on the game, but things I kind of discovered and found work well as I was making the game. Uh, so we'll just go through them quickly. One of them, that's a pretty simple one, uh, borders, not textures, or like uh, uh, smooth gradients, crisp lines. So it's like instead of using like a tiling grass texture, for example, telling you over and over, this is grass, this is also grass, this is also grass, this is also grass, you do most of your work uh, defining areas like around the edges of the areas instead of like in the middle of the areas because that's, that's where the interesting hap things happen, where different areas meet. And that's where you want to put the, like you can still have a texture, but like tone it down and put some focus on the borders instead. Uh, the other one, quite obvious, symmetry, like the, island, the game um, has an island in the middle that the camera rotates around, so very naturally get that symmetric feeling for it. And that's also a thing we try to play with in like the iconography on the game and a lot of the um, like key art of the game and stuff like that. Uh, it's kind of like a, this kind of shining city on a hill feel to it. Um, the other one, more sort of dramatic one, order and chaos, which sounds very dramatic. And in a lot of ways, we also have that very dramatically represented in Bad North. But if we sort of pull it down a notch, we get something more like establishing patterns and breaking patterns, or sort of make rules, break rules, which I think is a quite fundamental design principle in like all kinds of things, in game design, in, um, in art, in music as well, right? Like do things in a certain pattern, then like twist it up a little bit. And then when you get used to that, you twist it up a little bit. And there are a lot of that, I think, in the aesthetical aspects of, of Bad North too, both on quite low levels and on slightly higher levels. Uh, the next thing, respect abstraction. That sounds quite abstract. Uh, it is. We'll get some very, very concrete examples of that, though. And that's, it sort of ties into the idea of not seeing the forest for all the trees and striving to do the opposite of that. And of course, the next one's quite obvious. Uh, minimal uh, labor cost, especially minimal repetitive labor, because we are a very small team. It's me and one other guy full time and then audio guy half time. Uh, so like we don't have a lot of time to put into um, laborious workflow, so the whole game is designed around everything being very fast to produce. Not necessarily, like, because sometimes obviously it can take longer time to build the system than build, like, 
do everything manually. Uh, so we don't always save time from that, but it's also that very, very repetitive tasks tend to get quite boring, and they're also harder to tweak in the end, I think, than if you build very systems-based things where you can like tweak individual variables and everything changes. Yeah, uh, so those are sort of the basic things that hopefully we'll keep coming back to as we take a look inside the game. So yeah, uh, this is Bad North. How many here have played Bad North? So a few people. How many people have seen Bad North? It's more people, okay. Well, everyone who rose the hand the second time but not the first should buy it. Uh, yeah, so this is like the campaign view. It's changed a little bit from the version that's out there right now. Um, and from the campaign, we can enter one of the many islands. And of course, this is procedurally generated. So we'll start taking, uh, talking a little bit about what goes into making these islands. As I said, they're procedurally generated. They use um, an algorithm called uh, wave function collapse, which I didn't name it. It's quite a weird name. But it comes from a, sort of an idea of uh, like building a possibility space and then sort of collapsing it until you have one final um, solution. Um, so the way, but the way I interface with it, which is actually quite easy to understand, is I just give it a bunch of like tiles that I build in Maya, 3D tiles that looks like this, and then the algorithm figures out how to assemble them into complete levels. Uh, that also ties into the very, like as I said, minimal workflow, minimal workflow thing where um, I can just throw in new tile assets, generate new levels, and I'll get to see what those look like. So obviously, right now I have like quite a few tiles going on here. I think there's 400, something like that, which obviously like took a long time to build, but I did that over two years' time. Uh, but when I was just trying out the algorithm in the beginning and like trying to nail down the basic feel of the shape of the island, like how big are my bevels, what are like how frequent are my details, stuff like that. Uh, basically, everything I worked with was like these tiles over here, something like that. So I needed like 10 tiles, and then the algorithm figures out how to build that into separate levels. Um, so a benefit you have from that is you don't have to, like sometimes with procedural content, you have to make a lot of different permutations of things before it starts working. But with this algorithm, you don't, which makes it much quicker to work with. And you don't have to make all the weird like diagonal fitting pieces to work with every single use case because the kind of the tiles themselves restricts what kind of levels it can build out of them. Um, again, of course, uh, if you build a game out of tiles like this or any game out of tiles, that again ties into the sort of order thing where like you establish very, very clear patterns. You have a tile based game, grid based game. And that's something we've obviously largely leaned into. It is a very gridded island. It looks like, a, like it's a more blocky than an island would look, look like in real life. Uh, and obviously the basic gameplay of the game as well, like the grid squares you move your units to are on the same grid as the game is being generated on. But then, of course, make patterns, break patterns. Um, we do a bunch of little small things just to make it, like to break up the super obvious blockiness of it. One of the things we do is to, um, I implemented, and this is like one of, also one of my contributions, I think, to, to this, because I didn't invent this algorithm, but one thing that I brought to the algorithm is adding these sort of tiles that span across multiple uh, grid squares. So here's a good example of that. This little tile here, um, like actually consists of, uh, or module, we call them. This little module actually spans acro across three tiles, which makes that we can put like a little bit more of a crack into it that like, makes it a little bit larger, sort of rounds off the shape a little bit more, and it removes that super obvious sort of grid size from the rest of the game. Um, so that's a quite subtle way of doing it. That, that also means that we can sneak in uh, stuff like this, like this little sort of tunnel here, or... Um, um, yeah, we have some like uh, some bridges going. We have some caves, some bridges going on, and of course, having things stretch across multiple tiles also means that we can do um, uh, stairs, which you like. You need so the game doesn't all play on uh, take place on one uh, level. Also, just like from making this tool, as I said, workflow is very very important. And when you make procedural content, especially if you're not the same person writing the algorithm and doing the producing the art for it, you might end up with tools that require you to put in a lot of custom data. Like you make some tiles, export them to the game, and then you have to sit, import them into the engine, and then like mark things up to tell them what's going on in different tiles. But that's all been automated here. So um, as you see, if I highlight an edge here, 
it will highlight in yellow all the other edges that look the same. So that's just like the import algorithm, like looking through the mesh, looping through the edges and seeing what fits where. Um, yeah, and if I like highlight this side, you'll see everything with a straight edge, everything with a, uh, a straight horizontal edge, stuff like that. Another little fun thing that I'm, it's quite tiny, but I'm quite proud of it, that big breaks up the repeti uh, repetition a little bit, is like if you notice this very basic corner here, it's not entirely symmetrical. Like this is not a 45 degree edge, it's like slightly slanted, which means that if you put together like a, um, a sort of pillar, it will end up having slightly different, like it can be a bit pointy like this, or it can be a bit, little bit duller, or like it can be a little bit asymmetrical, stuff like that. So it's a very, very basic thing to break up the, ver the most common parts of the level without adding additional clutter to it, because that's another important thing. Uh, and in addition to that, I have another very tiny thing, which is like these little, right, because like, you want to add some, some additional detail too. So this is a little sort of adapter piece that has a little bit of a crack in it. Uh, and it flips the asymmetry. So you can have like a, a plane going one way, and then this little crack shows up, and then the plane goes another way. So it's a, it's a way to introduce like a little bit of extra detail, almost kind of a little bit of a texture to the cliff. Uh, and again, the, tech, the sort of textured crack here appears on the edge, not on the side of the cliff, because the side isn't an interesting place. What's interesting is what happens when the cliff bends. Uh, but it also produces some meaning in that it flips the, the side, so it sort of creates a bigger pattern than, than just the crack itself. So it's a very small thing. Uh, another thing we do to um, um, break up the tiles that's actually not in the released version of the game right now, but we'll see in an update fairly soon, because I just made this the other day, and I'm quite happy to show you. It's quite subtle again, like a lot of things in this game, is this little thing here. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Whoop. Oh yeah, whoa. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's very, very subtle, uh, but it's a way to just like smooth out the island a little bit. So this is what the release version looks like now. Uh, so all the edges are straight, and of course, like if you work with uh, uh, these kind of tile-based things, you're, like that can easily happen because of course this piece here doesn't know that the uh, that there's going to be a, a like a, an end to it here, right? So it it has to be purely straight, but then I add this little effect uh, afterwards. And this also, like, it's a way to smooth out the entire thing, but it does very much tie into the fact that the game is, like, voxel-based and gridded from the beginning, because what happens is, if we just look at the um, uh, island generation, and then we'll find the right island, here's the island, there's, like, a voxel space, yeah, we uh, create a voxel space from the island. Uh, some of it's quite obvious, it happens from the pieces. Uh, but also, as you can see here, the trees add a little bit of sort of voxel coverage to them. This is used for lighting as well, we'll get more into that later. But if you have a voxel space, space that means that you can also drip, drive normals from that, and those normals you can use to, for the lighting, but you can also use them to push the uh, edges a little bit of the entire thing to sort of smooth out the, the entire thing. This is quite a nice little thing. Very small, but quite nice. Um, yeah, and to the sort of abstractions part, there's a, like, I, I try to be very, very limited in what kind of things I put into the island, right? There's very, very few colors going on in the base island. There's basically three elements here. There's walkable areas, non-walkable areas, and cliffs, and that's it, right? So that's, because that's what you care about when you play the game. You're like, where can my troops go? Um, where's the... Like, and where are, the, where are the different layers and where are the paths between the different layers? So I don't need to have a rock texture telling you over and over again, there's a rock here, rock here, rock here, rock here. What you're interested in is like breaking it down, what's walkable, what's not walkable. So that's like all I'm playing towards with the, um, yeah, with the colors here. Um, uh, and also the, um, the forests, of course, play into this as well. And we ha here we also have a very clear case of this sort of, I mean, in the very literal sense, uh, trying to avoid not seeing the forest for all the trees, because that's a common error you can do, especially maybe as a quite junior artist, is you would make a very beautiful, detailed tree, but then you put it into an environment, and then that tree is like way too 
complex, and if you put a thousand of those trees around, it becomes very, very cluttered. Whereas as a player, you're probably just interested in like, there's a forest here. So my trees are like deliberately, like they have a little bit of a texture to them, and if you look very, very closely, you can see you know, what kind of trees they are, and you see that from the silhouette as well. But mostly they just blend together uh, in this larger blob, which helps you read the entire environment faster. And that also ties into the lighting, where like you can see if we just um, get back the sunset. Yeah, when the side comes into the side, the, from the side, the trit, again, they use these kind of normals from the voxel space. So when the si uh, light comes from the side, they light up the trees as a blob instead of uh, lighting up each individual tree. It's again a way to sort of build these larger abstractions and shapes rather than focus on the individual components. Uh, another very tiny thing of sort of make patterns break patterns thing is how um, the um, when we have these little slopes in the grass here, these are way uh, patchier than the rest of the grass, right? We have these very calm areas that sort of marks the main area, areas of navigability, the plains. But then you have these more patchy areas that sort of draw your attention a little bit more that mark out the places where you can navigate between the different levels. So it's an easy way to sort of mark out those as slightly more important. And this is also a thing that we are... Uh, it doesn't look exactly like that in the released version of the game, but this is coming out in a patch uh, quite soon. Sort of being a bit more consistent in how we use grass and not grass to, uh, uh, to communicate navigability. Uh, yeah, and of course, uh, another interesting, like as I said, the uh, a very, like in the borders, not textured thing, uh, we have the smooth gradient sharp outlines. So there's a bunch of different ways outlines are getting um, generated here. There's a bunch of different techniques to do outlines. But one thing I do for the trees here, for example, and this is also a thing I added very recently, is if you just turn off the um, voxel space. You'll see that the like here in the perspective it looks a little bit weird, but you see that each tree has like a little bit of a shadow behind it, so that's that means it's drawing each tree uh, twice, and the first time it draws it, it draws it darker, pushed back a little bit, and one pixel further out, and then it draws it again in the, in the right place, and one pixel further in in the right color. So that means that the outlines of the trees they will kind of form a common outline sometimes. So here you can I don't know how oh actually I think I implemented a thing to. Um, does that work? Do, 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 do. Yeah, it kind of works. So you can see that the yeah the tree like they form a common outline here, and you yeah they form more of a of, yeah of a common blob more than individual blobs because I, I push them uh, like that. Yeah, and I mean obviously here we see also all the kinds of other techniques I use for like for the island itself I use this very, I mean it's a basic very old school technique where I just draw the mesh. Uh, twice, once inside out and once right side out. Uh, one pixel pushed out the first time and one pixel pushed in the second time. Obviously, uh, when you have it pushed out as far as this, this looks very artifacty and you get these weird like spiky triangles at the ed edges. But if you pull it back to just be um, one pixel thick, it looks, it looks good, especially with some anti-aliasing on it. And even more so, uh, this, this is a trick I'm quite proud of too. You see the, actually I put a separate slider on that one. You see the little, um, like the shadow under the grass? So that's also all done in shader. And it uses a, a, a trick, like it's a, it's a shader function called ddy, which just measures how a pixel's value changes uh, in the vertical axis of the screen. And you can use that like to do things like put a tiny bit of shader underneath, a, a tiny bit of shadow underneath something in just one pass in the shader without drawing, drawing like the shadow in one polygon and then the the grass on top of that on another polygon. That's also the, like, that also breaks up a ton around the uh, edges of the triangles, but you don't really notice that if you pull it down to just uh, one pixel like that. So it's quite neat. So it produces an outline, but the outline gives, also gives a three-dimensional feeling to it. A lot, of the, a lot of the art in Bad North tries to blur the line between 2D and 3D. And that's one way we do it. Um, quite, oh, uh, technically also for the forests and also for the units in the game, we use, um, like they of course billboard, which is also something you don't really notice because they're so subtle in themselves, but they are just billboarding planes. Um, 
and we do that billboarding in the vertex shader instead of doing it in C sharp because that would be that would be quite slow, but doing it in the vertex shader is very very fast. Yeah, and so we have the sharp lines, and of course, what produces most of the soft gradients in the game is the lighting, which is a quite a specialized way of doing lighting that works really well if you have a voxel-based game, especially if you have a very low-res voxel-based game. So this is what it would look like without lighting. Uh, there's still a bit of normal lighting going on, but I think if we, because we can if we put in a bit of an overcast and some cloud coverage, then you see there's almost, there's still a tiny bit of normal lighting happening, but it's very little. But if we add the lighting to it, like there's a nice bit of AO to it. The way the AO is done is, um, we do a sort of ray marcher, but a very, very simplified ray marcher from, I built a little visualizer actually uh, yesterday for it. So if we sample from a position here, you'll see how it's sort of a, a tree going out from that position. Uh, so it's actually not ray marching in, sharp, in straight lines, but it's doing it in a tree structure. So if it stops early, it doesn't have to keep branching out from there, so it doesn't pr uh, produce perfect lines, but it's perfectly good enough for something as soft as the shadows we use in Bad North. So that's also a way where like, the technical aspects of it and the technical limitations of the specific game we're making sort of tie that into the, uh, the art in a way that doesn't, yeah, that sort of makes them all come together as one. Uh, so you'll see if I put it, put that one down here, you'll see how that area is darker, and it is darker because this sort of tree structure gets blocked. And that also gets baked down into an AO texture. So this is like a 3D texture. So these are like the slices. You can see the shape of the, uh, of the island here. And you see it's like darker here because this is like underwater. This is the lowest level. And then it gets brighter and brighter and fewer and fewer obstacles as you, as you go up from there. And having, having that lighting information in a very low rest 3D texture also means that it's really cheap to sample the lighting in all kinds of things uh, apart from the static environment. So in like the units walking around, I can just sample the 3D textures to get their lighting. The particle systems can sample this. Uh, all the little grass bits can sample this. So it's, a very, it's very fast to, to generate because it's so low resolution. And it's very, um, it's very fast to calculate as well because you just have to sample that and then map it to like a, an intensity value and then you have the lighting. So that's one way to produce very soft gradients that give you a sense of the three-dimensionality of the island without taking a lot of attention from like sharp shadows and, and weird shapes getting, getting created by that. Yeah, and now I thought we were gonna take a look at the uh, units of the game. It's of course a very, very important part of the gameplay. Uh, here we have the three, or no, the four basic unit types of the game. So it's like, a, yeah, you can hear a little bit. Hear them walking around too. So we got some archers, we got some pikemen, we got some uh, sword and shield guys. Uh, again, they, uh, there's a very basic thing here tying into the idea of abstractions where the units move around in groups and they stand around in squares. So it's all about trying to make the units read as a group and not as individual units most of the time. Though a lot of the time they do break up in individual units fighting together, and that's sort of when you start to lean into the more chaotic aspects, right? So when everything's going well for you, your strategy is working, your defense is working, your units um, uh, stand around in nice squares, work in unison, like the, the archers fire in synchrony, stuff like that. But when your defense strategy starts to break up, like in, individual units are like offending for themselves in all kinds of different parts of the maps, and it becomes quite like hard to read the battlefield. So that's a, quite, that's a fairly central thing uh, of the basic drama. But also, too, of course, the design of the units is just like with the trees. Are, they're supposed to be very simple, of just a very simple silhouette, so that when they stand together in a group, they like blend together as a square. Uh, they're also, because this was like making the units was actually one of the early on in like doing the basic R&D for this game, figuring out a good workflow for making the units was actually one of the bigger hangups, but it was quite uh, difficult to figure out how to do that in a way that doesn't require a lot of work doing a lot of different animations, require a very sort of labor intensive export pipeline where you like have to do a bunch of different animations for different styles of units and export them, then import them into Unity mark up the sprites and like put the sprites into different animations, uh, stuff like that. 
uh, and also take like a lot of texture space doing all the animations we wanted to do. So we, uh, or I came up with a, what I think is a fairly clever solution there where all these units, uh, the sprites they use all look like this. And they are that low resolution. Uh, so there are three different like animation sets being used for all units in the game. It's units with no, shield, uh, no sword, like the guys with the, my archers. Do I actually have, yeah, my archers and, there are, and my spears. And there are units with a sword in the backhand. So those are the guys who have a shield in the front hand. And there are the units with just a sword. And those get reused like throughout the game. And you see that the colors are all weird here and they have like big square blobby heads. Uh, that's because the colors here are actually UV coordinates that I then use to look up um, a, de a more detailed texture that contains stuff like the, yeah, the helmet here and the, so the specific style. So these units are all like using the same basic animations, but then I swap out what texture I'm mapping to those UV coordinates. That also means that I can have quite high resolution helmets and specific things um, that are like unique for each character, but I can have very low resolution, especially since they're so blobby in the shape, I can have very low resolution um, uh, sprites that I need to animate. And of course, the ones I have to animate, I have to export like a bunch of different versions of, so that, that's really helpful. Yeah, and also, uh, since they are so blobby in the shape, we actually, we're not doing, we're just animating them in two different directions or in one direction and then mirroring them. We're not doing like uh, towards the camera and away from the camera, not back and front. Uh, so you can see them like as you turn the camera, you see them, you see these guys flipping their swords like that. Uh, which is like, if you are looking for it, you do notice it happening, but when you're playing the game, you don't think about it. And I've had a lot of people playing the game and when I tell them the units are 2D, they were like, oh, okay, I didn't notice that. So that's quite neat. Uh, because they read more as a group, and the group is, of course, three-dimensional because there are like units and spread out in three-dimensional space in the group. And because some of the units, like these shield guys here, also have some parts of them that are not two-dimensional, but there are three-dimensional. You see the shields here just floating in front of them, just sort of tucked into them, kind of clipping them. But that's also since they're just one color, you don't really notice that they don't have an arm properly or stuff like that. And that's also because the... Like, just the silhouette of a guy with a sword in one hand, the sword, like, the guy's kind of symmetrical, the sword is kind of symmetrical. If you mirror that one, you don't really notice it, especially if you're standing in a group. But uh, stuff like the shield, that's very, very important in, again, sort of trying to play to the right abstractions, expressing the sort of directionality of the entire group. Like, where's the group looking? What kind of enemies are the group caring about? How are they moving? Stuff like that. Uh, so that's why the, the sh it, it's much more important that the, three, that the shield is three-dimensional than the character is three-dimensional. And that's the same with the, uh, with the arrows and the bows too, like the bows are 3D. Um, because the, like with the sword, you can, I don't know if, how many of you have animated melee things, but with a sword, you can get away with a lot. Like you just do a quick swipe in the air and it doesn't really matter in what direction. And then a guy gets hit by that and you kind of buy it. But with a thing like a bow, if you aim, pick up the bow, aim in one way and release it, and then the arrow fires that way, like it looks, it looks really weird. But if we have a three-dimensional bow, then that solves that quite easily. Another uh, more extreme example of that is, of course, the spears, which we've done with a separate sprite for the spear itself. So we can aim it in different directions. With a spear, is, like, it's even more di difficult than a bow, because a bow is kind of like a gun. You just need to aim it and shoot it. But a spear has to have a lot of weight to it too. So you're like aiming it in one direction and then if a unit comes from another direction, you don't want it just twitching around with the spear. You want to keep it in one direction. You want to point in the right direction before you hit and keep pointing in that direction afterwards, stuff like that. So that's why the spear is a separate thing, but not the sword. Uh, this approach to units comes with one very interesting limitation is I haven't actually figured out how to do good looking axes in the game which might sound like a weird thing if you're making a very Viking-themed game, like you might want axes in there. Uh, but I, and a lot of people have said that, and I've tried several times, but it's been really hard making good-looking axes work. Because if you just put them into the sprite, like I do with the swords, they, it becomes super obvious that all the axes in the game are either pointing that way or that way, and you really see them flipping around. Uh, you could do it in 3D, possibly, probably, but then, 
like when you animate things that are three-dimensional, you need to put a lot more work into them looking nice and feeling weighty than when you do two-dimensional things. So it's possible that an axe could work like possibly with a big enemy, uh, like a boss character or something like that. could possibly have a 3D axe he drags around and does some animations with, and then it could be more gimmicky or stuff like that. But a very, like, axes for, for regular units has been, has been very hard, so we've just skipped it. We do have axe throwers, though, but that's easier because then the axe is just throw, uh, flying in the air. Yeah, another thing that kind of ties into this um, abstraction idea as well is that since the game is kind of zoomed out, uh, most, of the, most of the kind of animation or how the game feels when it moves doesn't really come from the animation of the individual units. It much more comes from the uh, behavior of the group and how they, like from writing the AI. I feel like I'm doing more animation when I'm writing the AI than when I'm actually uh, animating the, the sprites because it's much more important like how they react to each other, when they back off, when they move forward, how they like flow around, when they walk around, stuff like that than uh, like how the arm's moving or how the leg's moving, stuff like that, because, it, because the game is so, so zoomed out. I think, I think that's an, a good takeaway in general, that when you do animations for a game, it's usually much like, you can make great looking animations, but if you don't put a lot of work into playing the right animation at the right time and like moving around in the right way, uh, it's probably not gonna look good. So it's probably better to have like good looking, good looking movement, than good-looking animations. It's probably more important to have good-looking animations than good-looking characters in that order. Um, yeah, so those are kind of some of the uh, basic ideas going on here. Uh, additionally, the, yeah, the, the water, the way I've done the water here, is, uh, it's a fairly basic, it's, I get a lot of questions about it, but it, it's really simple. It's, um, it's just like a mesh here that plays this sort of looping, wavy shader all over again. It's a pretty simple shader. Uh, and it also ties into the idea of expressing things in borders and not in like textures, not in fields. So the, what, most of the water is just completely flat, but then at the edge when uh, something meets the water, I highlight that instead. Um, so I don't need to tell you like over and over, it's water, it's water, it's water, it's water, it's water. It's more like where these two materials meet there's a coastline, that's it. And I thought we were gonna try and um, um, actually get some enemies in here. Let's see if that works. I think it did work. See what the game looks like more like in motion and how, um, I don't know if this is gonna be a difficult level or an easy level. And see more of, there's also of course this, yeah, I mean, and you get very much this symmetry idea too, with the, like when the game actually starts playing. So you have this like uh, quite isolated level in the middle, it's usually kind of uh, tall in the middle and then flatter towards the sides. And you have the enemies coming in from the side. Yeah, you see them trying to burn my house down. Okay, this might actually be a very difficult level. So they burned down a house there. And it also ties into the, the order and chaos kind of thing where your units are like restricted to moving in grid units uh, and defending, yeah, working in grid units, whereas the enemies, they just flow through freely and they, your units are just standing, standing on their grid squares where the enemies like coming from all over the place with like ships angled in all kinds of directions, stuff like that. The houses you're defending, they are all uh, kind of aligned to the grid uh, whereas the enemy ships are like pointing in all kinds of different directions. And of course, as you keep playing the game, the, the island turns from this like quite orderly, quaint looking, nice, uh, um, yeah, idyllic island to this very messy, bloody, chaotic place. So even if you win the game, it still, it still looks quite tragic. It looks like, like you won, but you know, it was still a pretty horrible battle and a lot of your units died. And so it's been, so, it's been quite important this for me to to like leave the corpses and bloody the level as you keep playing the game, also as a way of environmental storytelling. Okay, I think I'm gonna lose this game. I didn't pay attention, really. Also, a lot of the abilities in the game uh, try to, right, so these units here are probably gonna die pretty fast, um, but the, the abilities also, I try to make them look quite orderly so they feel like you regain control 
for a moment. So they're like trying to hold their ground there. But if I send them there, they get to do this very sort of, okay, now it was just one guy doing it, but they get to do like a very synchronized motion together where they are also invulnerable. So you're like in control for a little while until it all falls apart again. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely gonna lose this. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, so those are <coughs> uh, kind of the things I had um, uh, prepared. We can, we can just uh, take a look at a few uh, more islands, and I would be happy to take uh, some questions from the audience. And uh, since I'm in Unity, you can all ask all kinds of things, and I can like poke around and answer things if you if you want to. Yeah. Uh, are they pre-generated before the? Oh. Are the islands on the world map pre-generated uh, for that map, and then they look the same uh, with the procedural generation in 3D, or is it just sort of abstract in the map, and then whatever they look like? No, they they look there. the right way on the map. So you can you can definitely see, especially if you've played the game for a bit or made the game, you can like you see this really weird uh, thing going on here. If we enter that level, we will definitely we like we will see that shape here, right? Uh, so no, they, they're correctly, uh, they look the right way. The way we do it is we gen, like we have this cloud, um, which also has changed look now uh, in the campaign screen here you see, right? So this uh, also again plays into the, like the border is quite detailed, but then the this is quite uh, flat. Uh, so these are like, the behind this are levels you haven't discovered yet, as of course you know you've played the game. Uh, but we generate, like we try and generate ahead of the, so like the next levels uh, will have been gotten generated now. And when we generate the level, we take a, like a snapshot of it from above, bake that down into a, a texture that we also then save to the save file. So whenever you start up a new uh, startup or load a game, it has to generate all the levels again. But if it has already generated them once, then it all, they already know what they look like. And they also know, they also have a seed that will work with the generation. So actually, we will be pushing fairly soon an update to what some of the tiles look like and a few new tiles. So then if you load an old save, you'll see some of the islands changing shape on the world map as they load. Hi. So the, um, the island smoothing effect, is that the vertex? Are you pushing the vertex around, or is it the shader effect? Uh, I am pushing the, so the thing I did now with the slider, that's something I prepared yesterday. Uh, so I am actually in code, like when I, because I am merging all the islands into one, uh, um, uh, yeah, into one mesh, and then I'm looping through the, so uh, looping through the vertices and all pushing them the same way. But it's not enough to just push the, the mesh itself, because there are all kinds of other things that tie into it as well, right? When I run the grass placing algorithm, for example, that has to run on the same, like, slightly modified world. And then the nav mesh, of course, well, the grass runs on the nav mesh, but the nav mesh, too, has to be modified in the same way as the island. Um, so here I just did, like, I do that, but then I also save the offset so I could then, in a shader, like, reapply the, the old offset. Uh, but yeah. Sorry, I'm taking another question. Uh, are you using Unity's built-in nav mesh or your own? No, I, I built my own. Yeah, okay. It's it's even like you can actually see um, if you look at the different, like the green part here in the meshes. Uh, that's actually the nav mesh. So I build that in. Like I build the nav mesh pieces in Maya just like I would build the regular mesh. Then I ask when it's already built. When it's built the level, it takes all the nav mesh pieces and tie together and build the nav mesh out of that. Uh, actually, writing the navmesh is really fun, and I can recommend writing your own navmesh. It's much more fun than you would think it is. It's a lot of very, very small math problems. Uh, how much work and precision has to go into making each like module? Uh, to make them fit together? Yeah, to make them fit, fit yeah, together. Yeah, good question. Um, so there is some... So there's different ways you could do this, but the way I do this is I, from a side, I generate a hash value from like the positions of the edge, but then I round them somewhat. So it doesn't have to be perfect precision, but since it's a rounding thing, like if I end up, if I have two things that are almost exactly the same, but they just happen to be on opposite ed uh, like uh, sides of the rounding, then they won't fit together. Um, so that, especially in the beginning, it was a little bit of a hassle, but now I have a, 
if you just do the work right in Maya, and you just like, if I build a new piece, I copy a bunch of old pieces that have the right sides, and then I keep those edges, right, and then tie it together, then it's actually very easy. Uh, but you have to keep that in mind. And that's also why it's so important that I have this, uh, uh, like visualizer here, right? So I can, if I if I build some new interesting pieces, I can actually make sure that, like, yeah, it fits together with the old things, like it's supposed to. Yep. If you want to get into procedural generation, where should one start? Good question. Um, well, the so I showed in. Actually, the algorithm that built the thing in the middle here—that's a pretty good place to start. It's called. Um, well, this one's 3D, so it's called uh, marching cubes, but the 2D version is called marching squares. It's just like it's a very simple algorithm to place tiles on a grid or in a voxel space. Uh, it's very easy to understand and very easy to start working with. That's not the algorithm I use in Bad North, though the pieces look very similar. Uh, I might have seen wrong, but when you show the uh, the scene. Uh, and you see the island, it looks like you flip the island, uh, so you get that reflection effect in yep. the water. Yep. Is that done entirely uh, in, um, in shade, or is it actually a model underneath the water? Uh, I mean, it is, like, it would be the same which way I would have done it, but it is, uh, it is a model, and, well, it's both, actually. It's, because <laughs> I, whenever I create, like, some things are marked up that they're supposed to have an outline or, outline or they're supposed to have a mirror, and then if they're supposed to have a mirror, then I just like create another instance of that game object that has the mirror, and then I, in the shader, it then flips that upside down as well. Like flipping it is obviously quite easy, but it also does some things to like, it simplifies a lot of the, it does, it runs the same shader, but there's a lot of places where it skips some steps that aren't needed when it does the mirror. And of course it applies like an almost uniform color to it as well. But you're correct in that it is a flipped, flipped mesh. Um, hi, so uh, you uh, make all the model components and you do all of the coding as well. Would you consider yourself a coder who does art or an artist who does coder? Uh, very much an artist that does code, because uh, I come very much from an art background and I don't really do much code outside of code that in the end will produce some kind of art. Uh, but I'm pretty far down the code rabbit hole now, so yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, awesome, by the way. It was uh, super interesting. And I know there are a lot of students here, so I'm going to ask a very uh, helpful student question. What's your workflow? And uh, can you pick like an everyday work day and uh, go sure. through it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, like, as I said, we work in a very small team. Um, uh, I start the day with. Well, I don't start the day like, but when I've been up for like three hours, uh, I do a, a call with my colleague Richard, who's just woken up. Uh, <laughs> and then we, yeah, we do a stand-up meeting. That's fairly, uh, it's very standard. I've done that in all places I've been at. So like, just go through like, what did we do yesterday? What are we doing today? Are there any news? Stuff like that. Uh, and then the rest of the day, like as I said, I work from home, so I have a pretty free schedule. Um, it, it really depends. It can be very, very different. I like some some days I spend the entire day in Visual Studio writing code. Sometimes I do a lot of art things. It's it's pretty much all over the place. Yeah, it's very something that's like a lot of people ask me. Working from home is it hard to be disciplined? But it's more the opposite. It's very hard to get away from the computer. Like I, I usually sleep quite badly because I like go straight from the computer to bed, which is a very, very bad idea. Don't do that. To follow up on that, that you work on ho from home, do you have any like techniques to stay working? Uh, yeah, uh, don't have any other hobbies than work. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's that's basically true. Like I haven't really played any video like video games for a long time, which I probably should do. But uh, it was a long time ago since I played a video game, and um, uh, all my other hobbies require like friends or physical activity, so I can't do them all the day anyway. So. When I'm at home, that's like the only thing I can, like when I'm done with my chores, that's the only thing I can do. Yeah. Do you in your, oh, 
Do you and your team have a specific goal for the game, other than just making a success, successful, uh, successful game that creates revenue? Uh, I mean, yeah. For for me, it was very like. For me, it was very much also just designing a whole. The game is very much just designed around what I think is fun to do. And that's been a, I think that's a good, especially if you're a very small team, I think that's a very good approach to, because to have, so, because it's very easy to, especially when you're discussing something with someone else, to fall into things that seem objectively defensible, which would be like, yeah, how do we make more money? Or if you have like idealistic goals, that could also be a thing. But it's harder to defend, like, no, I want to do it this way. I think it's more fun to do that kind of work. But I think it's very important because if it's fun to do the work, you'll do it better, you'll do more of it, and like you won't be as stressed out and you'll you'll like it more. Uh so that's been a very that's been a very big part of, of Bad North, trying to just design a game around the kind of things I enjoy doing. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um I haven't played the game, but I'm just assuming here that um for each island that you get to, it get in increasingly harder. Yeah. And my question is then, um, is the procedural generation of every island, like, does the island geometry like get more difficult? And how have you like programmed that in that it, that you just tell the, uh, like the algorithm to generate a harder level for me? Like, how does that actually work? Yeah. Uh, so no, we don't do any of that. We just make them bigger. <laughs> because uh, that's that's easy <laughs> but no it's quite it's quite an abstract concept to figure out what makes it because the shape of the island does matter a lot for how difficult they are especially especially depending on your play style and what your loadout is like are you playing a lot with archers or with spears or whatever um but there's <laughs> those things are quite abstract and they're quite hard to put it like first of all i don't know if we have we have a great grasp on that and even if we did it's not obvious how you would evaluate that, like if you give an island, like how do you break that down and, and evaluate a level and give it a difficulty score? Um, and if, then if we did that, we would also then have to figure out, okay, but how do we then generate an island that tries to achieve a certain level of difficulty? That, like that's quite an abstract and difficult problem, which like sounds super interesting, but we've just not done any of it. Uh, we do, we do. I mean, we do switch up also, so that like the earlier islands are less complex. They use, I mean, of course, because they're smaller, but they also use fewer uh, modules. I have some modules that are like marked up because so, they're themed, right? So you get some themes throughout the game that we keep switching up as well. Also, like a way to, yeah, keep uh, breaking up the pattern. Um, so yeah, we have these. I mean, I, I think we've seen some, uh, we've, we've seen some caves. The level we played first had caves. Uh, also, here's like some some ruin style things with like some walls and stuff like that. Those kind of things they break up the gameplay a little bit because like the caves are you need to keep track of all the different weird paths the units can take. Um, yeah, but it's it's mostly as an aesthetical thing. Yeah. So we vary the difficulty just by sending more enemies and then hope that the randomness from what the ways the level looks aren't like too far out of bounds. Was there any conscious reason why you choose to uh, develop the game in Unity uh, instead of uh, another engine? Uh, I don't know if I would call it a conscious reason, but uh, I've like I've been doing previous projects in Unity as well. Uh, I quite like it. I think Unity is a very good way to get into coding. That's how I got into coding, because it. Um, um, or my understanding, I haven't worked much in Unreal. Like I've done some student projects in Unreal, but my understanding is that the the sort of the border between um, what you do in sort of normal engine tools and what you do in code is moved quite far ahead in Unreal. Like, in, it's it's quite in a different space. On the other hand, you do have the very like uh, powerful blueprint in their scripting system, which like is great, but it's not as good as writing it in C sharp. Like, you can't do as like you can do a lot of things, but you can't do as much, especially not for the same performance, right? Uh, but then in, in Unreal, you would then instead go the extra the step after that and start rewriting the, the source code in C++, which is like a, a bigger threshold. So it's like, it's similar thresholds, but they're moved in quite different places. And to me, it for my current uh, expertise, it fit me very well to write the code in C Sharp, which is like a fairly easy language to learn. Hey. Um so you posted on Twitter a lot of your uh, pro progress and how you did things. And 
was that part of your marketing strategy? Because it definitely got me hooked and <laughs> made me buy the game. So if it was, it worked. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I mean, it obviously, it obviously was, but I, I didn't post on Twitter because I wanted to do marketing. It's more like I posted on Twitter, and that was also marketing. Because that's uh, especially, I really like showing things I do. When I think I come up with something clever, I want to show people. And especially since I work from home, I don't have colleagues. Well, I can show Richard, but I don't have that many colleagues to show. So then I can po post it on Twitter and show people there instead, which is very nice. And it's very, it's very encouraging, too, uh, all, the, all the positive feedback you get. And I find also a common pattern in my workflow is that I do something and then I sit around tweaking it for too long, but then as soon as I make a GIF and post it on Twitter, then I'm done with it, and then I move on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, how was the transition from working in Ubisoft to becoming an indie developer, and how can you use that experience? Use the Ubisoft experience? Yes. Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, it's a, fair, it's a very big difference. The biggest and nicest difference is that there's just less time spent in meetings, because uh, that's quite, too, like, you can be however low level you want, you're still going to spend like a significant amount of your work week in meetings in a big company like that. And um, obviously, it's way less, frust like, the turnaround times for everything is much quicker. And obviously, I don't have to, like, I can take the decision straight away. I don't have to wait for a chain of commands. So that's much nicer. Uh, but I do think I benefited a lot from it because I got to meet uh, so many like uh, talented senior people. Work like there's just such a huge reservoir of expertise in such a big company. So many people to learn with. You get to sit next to someone who's like been in the industry for 15 years and, and learn all kinds of things from them. So it, for me, it was, I feel like it was a really good place to get started. It's also a very good thing to have in your CV. And like if this indie thing fails, which it does for many people. Um, yeah, but I enjoy this way more. So it was mentioned earlier, or just before the last question, about uh, you're, you're posting on your progress with uh, Bad North on Twitter. Have you considered like setting up, uh, like on part of your website or something, like just an overview of the progress and how each thing has been done, or would that be like, I don't know? Uh, no, I mean I haven't thought about that specifically. I've thought a lot about like. Would it be good to gather some of these things into more than just like tweets I keep sending off? Maybe it would be. Uh, that's also probably a lot of work. Uh, probably not. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm thinking. I'm thinking about like probably not for Bad North, but uh, I've been thinking about after this. I'm not sure I will, but I might do some other more just demo projects like the the house and the planet thing, and doing it in a way where I consciously think that I will make like. I will tutorialize some aspects of this. I will like, uh, like maybe make sure the cl the code is quite clean, so I'd be happy to share it if I would have to in the future. Stuff like that. Uh, so not probably not with Bad North, but 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 I do I do like explaining things and showing things off. But it's also it's also a lot of work, those kind of things. So yeah, maybe something in the future. Another uh, one. one more. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I had one question about a solution to the axes. Uh, about what? A, a solution about the uh, axes. Yeah. Because uh, I, I don't know if it's about the uh, how you've planned the aesthetic of Bad North, but would it be blasphemy to put in double-sided axes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think uh, we're about done then. Oh, no. I might be deep into the, uh, the dark zone of what you uh, want to say and like yep. to keep quiet, but uh, have you thought about what would be the problem of why people would stop playing your game and what solution would that be? 
Oh, uh, sh uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, people would stop playing it probably because there should probably be a little bit more content in it. Uh, we should probably we wanted to put way more like items and abilities in there that we just hadn't had the time to make. It's probably coming from content. Like we have a big content up, shh, but we have it. Oh, this is on Twitch. Okay, whatever. We have a. <laughs> We're going to do some content update, and then we'll hopefully put in some more of those things. Uh, so that's one big thing. Uh, obviously, it's also, there's a little bit of a disconnect between, which I don't find problematic myself, but there's a little bit of a disconnect between, the game looks quite sort of cute, uh, but it, it is quite hard, actually. It is very easy to get into and learn the controls, but it does get quite difficult, and there's permadeath in it, right? So there are like definitely some people who get dragged into the... Um, dragged into it for the cuteness, and then also find, oh, this is a strategy game, that's actually quite fun with strategy, but then like it does get quite difficult and quite punishing, and some people definitely get surprised and maybe put off by that after a bit, yeah. All right, I think we'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you very much.